Michael Zavros is an artist of remarkable depth and nuance. An artist whose star is rising nationally and internationally. As Tim mentioned, he is from Queensland, where he graduated from the Queensland College of Art in 1996 and where he continues to live. He built his reputation painting beauty, European palaces, luxury cars and hand-tailored suits, exotic animals and flowers. His iconography draws as much on the world of advertising as it does the world of art, which it knowingly collapses together. Whether conceived as a photograph, video, performance or painting, Michael Zavros's work is unashamedly aestheticised. Like a Hermes spread in Vanity Fair, it invites you to admire its technical virtuosity, to dwell in the realm of its perfection. But then it leaves you wondering, could this artist's life be so undisturbed, so blemish-free, so relentlessly art-directed? Well, fear not, as we'll attempt to answer that question shortly. Before we do, however, I want first to introduce the subject of the 2016 Foundation Appeal, Michael Zavros's Bad Dad of 2013. It's arguable that much of Michael Zavros's work constitutes a form of self-portraiture. Its knowingly exotic and looks world is the ultimate projection of personal values. In that world, there has been little room for much other than the celebration of beauty, until lately, that is. In more recent work, the self in Zavros's portraits has emerged more literally, first in the form of his abiding muse, his young daughter Phoebe, who joins us tonight, and then in images of himself. It's at this point that beauty can turn from vanity to vanitas, from that which revels in beauty to that which warns of the perils of its temporal and thus essentially transient nature. Bad Dad is a self-portrait in the guise of Narcissus, the young hunter of Greek mythology who was as known for his extraordinary beauty as his excessive pride. Always disdaining those who loved him, he would have been a very bad dad indeed. The story is that Nemesis, the goddess of divine retribution against hubris, lured him to a pool where he fell in love with his own reflection, not realising it was merely an image. Unable to tear himself away from the entrancing reflection, Narcissus stared at it until he died. Renaissance theorist Leon Battista Alberti called Narcissus the inventor of painting, asking, what is a painting but the act of embracing by means of art the surface of the pool? While lingering in a pool doesn't necessarily make you a bad dad, there is a cocktail of conceits here, drawing, as Zavros does, on the history of art, on fashion, the selfie generation, and more. Bad Dad is not the artist's first dalliance with the Narcissus theme, and it seems unlikely to be his last. This meticulously painted miniature, V12 Narcissus, finds Michael lost in the high gloss polish of a Mercedes. It recalls his childhood on the Gold Coast, when he and his father would bond over visits to local car dealerships. To them, the Mercedes were symbols of success, what Zavros has called the Irish-Greek Cypriot families migrant materialism, and others have called status anxiety. Restaging the myth, Zavros contemplates consumerist culture and concedes how possessions define our identities and mediate our personal relationships. Michael Zavros encountered this painting by Caravaggio while in Rome on the Bulgari Art Prize Scholarship and it drove a breakthrough or a revelation of the enduring power of light. He was struck by its theatricality, that insistent chiaroscuro of the human form dramatically lit from above left, Narcissus emerging into the world and into the light out of a Stygian gloom. Almost two centuries later, 18th century French painter Le Pisse takes on the subject and demonstrates what a staple of the classical canon Narcissus had become. His Narcissus seems altogether dreamier, more spent and less intent than Caravaggio's and Zavros's, 
more emphatically masculine and fixed hold on the subject. Having regard to the selfie, gener selfie generation's embrace of what Zavros has described as a new ordinariness to narcissism, the palate of his bad dad is clearly pop, not old master. The sharp, unforgiving light that floods his backyard pool finds its equivalence in contemporary fashion photography, yet another of the lenses through which to see this painting. The pool toy on which Zavros lolls is a nod to Jeff Koons and to artists like Cindy Sherman and Warhol, all three appropriating images from pop culture and then subverting them. Ostensibly vacuous, they are imbued with somewhat more than air. As we look at them, like that Mercedes, they reflect us back to ourselves in a neat, narcissistic stratagem. One of the things I find striking about Bad Dad is the absence of a perceptible solid and defining edge. It's an essentially borderless painting, a figure floating, framed within a body of water, much as Caravaggio's Narcissus is entirely framed in deep recessive shadow. It eschews that sense of an organising geometry you find in early David Hockney, another touch point. Hockney's iconic, sun-drenched, LA-based sunbather has a more than coincidental conjunction with Zavros's The Sunbather, 2015, which will shortly become apparent. Although Zavros's Sunbather is another self-portrait, a borderline narcissus at that, it paradoxically seems more interrogating of our gaze than the languid gaze of its subject. In a smaller variant on the same theme, this time painted on metal, Zavros bathes in the more baroque light of Caravaggio, the old master, for now, trumping the princes of pop. Clearly, I think Bad Dad represents a major moment in Michael Zavros's career, and I look forward to seeing what comes next. But tonight, to examine the ideas and processes behind this work, will you please join me in welcoming Michael Zavros to the stage. So Michael, there you are, working on your tan, indolent, <laughs> endlessly fascinated by your own reflection, the noodles and the blow-up toys abandoned in the pool. Is this a self-portrait as Narcissus, a self-portrait of a truly neglectful father, or is it really, as I've suggested elsewhere, a Zavros family portrait in absentia? Um, I should I should point out that I'm I, I never suntan. I'm I'm, I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> this this just happens whether I like it or not. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I'm a good dad insofar as we're very sun smart in our house and. <laughs> Um, and good mum will attest that I, I lather everyone with sunscreen constantly <laughs> because, you know, we live in Australia and you would know with your difficult skin, I Chris, do. that... I do, you, Michael. You, Thank you. You, you, cannot, <laughs> you, you cannot venture outside without <laughs> coming up. But in answer to your question, I think it's... Um, How does this explain the fan <laughs> line? <I'm> <laughs> well, well, I've taken up swimming, uh, swimming laps, actually, and uh, that gives you that curious tan line, which yeah. uh, link, linked me to the, the Hockney, but... Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think it's all of those things, um, absolutely all of those things, and but maybe not all of them at once. I think right. it, 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 the, the, the genesis of the work was very much just casting myself in in that role, that that audacious role w once again. But um, as as I built the work, a, as it were, it, it it settled into something else, yeah. um, something something more potent, so yeah. a, a bigger, more important work for me. Yeah. It compels me to ask, um, what does being a parent mean to you? Because Tim's already made a few observations on that. <laughs> and how does being a parent filter into your work? Um, I, I think being a parent is the most important thing um, th th that I am. And, and I'm, I'm an obsessive artist. I spend all, all, all my time in the studio. But... I know that being a dad is, is is the biggest and most important job that I will have, yeah. um, but but I do reflect certainly at the moment um, a, a about th th this painting or or about an artist sort of giving back to themselves and and this 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 daily practice of painting this this thing that um, yeah. as so many artists 
that have gone before me just just slavishly do and and yeah. and, and need to do in order to understand themselves that you know we have this little boy at the moment he's just turned 5 and every afternoon he he wants my attention and as as good mum will attest he he only wants my attention he wants to do the sorts of things that you do with your dad and yeah. and and because i paint i i say to him in a minute I'll, i will in in a minute and then it starts to <laughs> and then it starts to get dark and he wants he wants to throw a ball or play frisbee or or learn to ride a bike which should have happened last year but it's just <laughs> i just keep painting and so i will set up a drawing for him and and it's at those moments where i think i need to break this yeah to break this yeah. and and to um to to, to you know do, do what he needs me to do yeah. but um anyway, that's, that's, yeah that's, 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 that's just a well it's not the first time <laughs> i mentioned that you've Fett invoked story. narcissus um, there was the, the V12 Narcissus painting, which is in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Beautiful painting. And <clears throat> it was runner-up in the Doug Moran um, Prize, the National Portrait Prize. Mm -hmm. And Bad Dad, as has been mentioned, was a finalist in the 2013 Archer Board. Mm -hmm. For me, it feels like a very self-aware and conscious strategy on your part. But I'd love to know more about the particular story um, through which you came to find this Caravaggio in Palazzo Barberini in Rome. Mm -hmm. Why did that painting at that particular moment, a few years ago, have resonance for you still? We're in the 21st century, that mm -hmm. belongs to the 17th. What mm -hmm. was it about that painting that excited you? Um, I, I guess I should say, I, I think that the, the, the first thing I think of when I, if I make a self-portrait is that it is a kind of narcissistic gesture. And, yeah. um, I guess the first time was re re referencing that and paying homage to that. but. Mm. Um, Seeing that work, which I'd seen in reproduction plenty of times and, and other um, other Narcissus uh, paintings, but uh, I guess the Caravaggio was just such a such an important pivotal work. Yeah. It um, I was I was transfixed by um, I think how the 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 genius composition of the work just fed so perfectly into the concept and how mm. he 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 developed this. Um, or offered this sense of paralysis, this mm. th this this kind of th this this emptiness, this this longing by by offering this this black void yeah. within the, you know the, the middle of this work, and it's such a curious compositional device, but mm. it just it just brought home um, the, the, the the notion of of narcissus so mm. so beautifully, and I was I, I was just so struck by by this work in the flesh. Mm. Um, that it just it did that lovely thing that that, that that art does. It reminds you of of what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, yeah. and, and just uh, um, yeah. s sends you off, you know, yeah. in, into your imagination. It's an incredibly powerful painting, mm. and I think that it's that thing of the figure advancing into the light mm. that gives it its drama. Yes. And yet, in this work, um, you're doing the exact opposite. The yeah. Uh, the field could not be more flooded with light yeah. um, and you know as you've presented it in Bad Dad and one of the things that that makes me think about is the process of translating an idea uh, like that which you found in the Caravaggio into this work because mm -hmm. uh, their palette, their finish to some extent mm -hmm. uh, could not be more diametrically different. Mm -hmm. One is um, surrounded by water or the figure is surrounded by water rather than on the, the sort of water's edge, gazing down at its very edge. Um, and yet it's, um, as I was saying earlier, it's got a almost a pop palette to it because it's flooded with light. There's none of that chiaroscuro that you think of with Baroque painting. Mm -hmm. So when you painted the smaller sunbather, which we also mentioned, mm -hmm. that reference back to Caravaggio was, was really obvious. Mm -hmm. You were actually bathing in the gloom rather than <laughs> bathing in the light. The moonlight. So why did you start, why did you make that transition from what you found in Caravaggio to this light-saturated painting? Um, I, I guess I knew that I wanted it to have that, that very high-keyed pop um, yeah. um, as aesthetic. Um, and, and I think a, li a little bit in, in the way that I, I think of um, you know, really boppy pop songs can can, can be the, the you know the the, 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 the saddest songs. Yeah. There's there's a way to sort of turn up the volume and and actually deliver this kind of quiet paralysis. Yeah. Um, I just 
I mean, I, I, I'm fascinated by artists like Jeff Koons, as I think mm. you, you, you mentioned um, so beautifully. But um, yeah, I just really wanted that that high pop, that yeah. that high drama, but to deliver that with a kind of stillness. I yeah. think it is a turn up the volume painting. It mm. really is, mm -hmm. <laughs> not just in light terms. But yeah. um, one of the things I think that. Uh, our audience would be interested in is the kind of process you go through. There's a yes, there's a, a research or discovery process which, of which the Caravaggio forms part, mm -hmm. and there are all of these other ideas and influences that all of us carry with us that mm -hmm. then get, in some way, absorbed into the work. Yep. But would you be happy to say just a few things about how you sort of move through the stages of evolution yeah, in developing a painting of this kind of complexity? Yeah. Um, I guess it starts with you know the the, the genesis of an idea. I, I I I did have something very like this in in mind, um, and then it's just a matter of creating it. And then there are all these lovely serendipitous things that 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 happen. And whilst not all of that is intentional, yeah. um, you, you're still making choices, yeah. and so it becomes intentional. Um, and I've noticed in my practice that the creative moment has started to extend uh, a right. long way, whereas er earlier in my career I'd worked from found imagery or things yeah. that I would, I would, I yeah. would happen upon and, and that, you know, the, 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 the creative moment would be literally the, the shift in context. Almost in, immediate, yeah. But now I'm devising these things and so it happens incrementally. It sort of it mm. starts with this and it sort of ends up over here. Yeah. But um, knowing that I was going to make a, um, uh, a Narcissus work and that it would be in the pool, that it would be very, very bright with, with a bunch mm. of pool toys, um, was, was only the, 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 the genesis. And then, and then basically we, we, we get into shooting this thing and I have yes. my, my trusty assistant <coughs> who presses the yeah. button on, on the, the, the camera that I'm directing and shouting and doing all this stuff. And, um, and then I'm left with, a, I guess, a photo shoot, which yep. is never right and so we do it again. Um, but it's it, it, with, with something like this. It's it's I'm working from composite images, and I start to piece together something yeah. that, that that I I want to see. And and yeah. serendipitous things happen. Like a a friend gives us um, um, a, a, that inflatable bunny from from Lacma, and it's not yes. actually a Coons, but it looks very like a Jeff Coons. And I yeah. think I, I'm going to use this somehow. Um, but then it's the, the the challenge is to shoot it so that you're not sort of mounting the bunny, you're sort of on it. <laughs> and, 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 that wouldn't and, have been and, good. Oh, curiously, they all sort of look like that. And, yeah, and then, yeah. And then it's, little, it's little things like yeah, I'm actually having to stand on a chair so that I'm sort of, sort of applying some pressure but not really sinking yeah. <laughs> into yeah, this yeah. thing. And there's just lots and lots of little, little bits and pieces. And yeah. then, and then as, I'm, as I'm building this work, it'll be um, the placement of those toys, which th 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 there is no photograph that, yeah. that, that, that exists that looks like this. There'll yeah. be, I will start to put this orange thing here and I'll decide this, this yellow pool noodle will be like yeah. this perfect leading line and that you know, this, this particular bunny will provide this, with its reflection, this, this white cross that just sort of... Yeah. Um, you know, Creates an X. Absolutely. So it's, it's kind of the, the, the complete yeah. opposite of the, the Caravaggio. Yeah. But... Um, it's, it's those little choices as, yeah. as you build something. And I kind of, uh, I'm better at letting things sit for a while and yeah. Um, yeah. Um, not, not leaping into them very quickly. And then once, once all that's finished, the, the physical painting is a completely different mm. um, mode. It's, it's no longer a, yeah. cre a creative one. It's, it's, it's a, a technical hard yeah. work. Yeah. I'd like to actually um, develop that a bit because I've mentioned that this is a painting that really is drenched in light. It's less mm -hmm. cool and dry, I think, in its palette and its finish than a lot of earlier work. Yeah. It feels like you made a shift here or a bit of a breakthrough. Perhaps it was in the application of glazes because this seems a more involved painting in terms mm -hmm. of its surface glazing. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's right or if it's something like that, are you, are you happy to talk us yeah, through? Yeah, of, of course. Look, it, that it finish is. feels different to me to yes, a lot yes. of preceding work. Look, it, it is. Um, and, and this was what one work where I, I really wanted to shift the way I'd been painting um, for some time, which, which had suited what I was painting. Yeah. But I guess in, in the context of this would have been a little anemic. And so I'd yeah. started to investigate um, old master techniques of building work tonally and painting quite literally this in monochrome. So yeah. it's, it's in brown and, and white. Um, and building 
tonal structure that mm. way so that I can then paint over the top in very pure colours. Mm. And mm. It's, it's what, it's what um, you know, so many old master painters mm. have, have done, as, as you mm. know, to, to, to give their work a kind of luminosity. Mm. And, and you see it now when you look at still life that it's hundreds and hundreds of years old and these yeah. tulips are just waxy and red and, yeah. and it is because they've been built this way with yeah. these very pure colours that sit on top of, yeah. uh, the pure but translucent colours that mm. sit on top of um, uh, this, this tonal structure. And I, I hadn't really done it before, I hadn't learned to paint that way, but painting in layers again mm. um, was, was the trick. Otherwise, I just don't think I could have um, mm. brought such a bright... Yeah. Um, Oddly enough, the Australian artist who does it best is Russell Drysdale. Right. Russell Drysdale uses exactly that technique and has done for, you know, through most of his career. And that's why there's that um, beautiful luminosity about those pictures. They yeah. have a glow to them wow. that you might think of with Titian or Giorgione yeah, or someone yeah. like that who he loved. Yeah. But I, I love that about this work, that it's got more visual depth to it, mm. I think, than um, certainly other works. But mm. another thing I wanted just to ask about is the sense of time in this image. Mm -hmm. There's the self-reflective glaze with a glaze, gaze, without end. Yes. The slowing of time inherent in the almost still but not quite water and the time taken to paint. Mm -hmm. While I'm always reluctant how long it takes someone to make something like this because brilliant and enduring things can often you know, take a moment to realise, it still makes me curious. So what time does a work like this take and how do you factor time into a work? How do you think about time in a work? Um, I, I think about time constantly um, yeah. because I, I guess like everyone is, is time poor and I'm always working mm. towards a deadline and investigating those, those hours before yeah. breakfast and after dinner and all, all of that stuff. But um, I think in so many ways a work <coughs> that, that takes a long time to make and my paintings you know, take me a long time, yeah. it is kind of the evocation of time, you, you sort of see a slice right. of time sort of on, on the canvas, you, you know that this is two months, two yeah. months of yeah. someone's life. Yeah. Um, but I think of time in other ways, I mean this, uh, especially now that I'm making paintings of still life, you know, it's this, this idea of freezing something in its, in its, um, um, at its peak, at its, at its, you yeah. know, at its, its, you know this, this perfect moment and um, how we can slow that, um, you know that, that inexorable movement of time, yeah. but um, yeah, I, I I love time. I love sort of trying to manage my time and 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 that that slow time that that, that yeah. I have in the studio. I think yeah. it's um, and and people people do um, ascribe a certain value to to mm. time. How long did that take you to make? And yeah, um, but as as you point out, you know, like fleeting moments are, ju are just mm. as potent. You know, in, yeah. in contemporary art. Yeah. Just taking um, us back to the story you were telling about the photography mm -hmm. uh, in staging yes. a scene like this, um, I think that in many respects this painting redoubles as a self-portrait because you've been photographing yourself or you've been photographed mm -hmm. in order to paint your own self-portrait. But I think the important distinction here is that you're an artist who also works with photography mm -hmm. as an independent medium mm -hmm. and video and performance, um, but of course you're best known as a painter. So is painting the handmaiden of photography here or is it the other way around? Um, I think that... So, so, so the handmaiden is... is well, is, 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 the, the, is the, the painting a slave to the photograph? No, or I, I think it's... Is I think it it's springboard? In, 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 in this instance, it's very much the other way around. And, and yeah. Because effectively, this photograph doesn't really exist. I could never have shown, yeah. shown this photograph. It was only ever going to be a painting, I wanted to make a painting, sort of be a, be a part of that lineage, I suppose, add, add something to that, yeah. that, to that Narcissus um, myth. But I think, I think crucially too with something like this that there is something wonderfully pointless um, about this, this, this loving gesture over two months. I mean, yeah. as, as you say, it's rendered very closely to a photograph. I could have just shown something that is, that is much yeah. like a photograph. But there is a narcissism within the gesture itself. This artist yeah. continually giving back to the work in this pointless sort of circuitous motion yeah. of, of, um, of, 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 of love, I suppose. It's yeah. a lovingly rendered thing where 
you know, what I'm making and how I'm doing it kind of mirror each other. And yeah. there's a system within the work. It, it yeah. it's almost doesn't need a viewer. It's just so mm. contained. Self-contained. And I think that that is crucial to how yeah. the work operates. I, in, in this instance, and I, I, I weigh this up often with my work, um, I, I don't think the photograph would have behaved in the same way. I think no. it would have been kind of vainglorious rather than yep. n utterly narcissistic. Yeah. I, I look at this painting and I don't for a moment think of photorealism. I saw a, an exhibition of Richard Estes' work mm -hmm. in New York last year and, you know, a, an archetypal American photorealist. Mm -hmm. And there's almost, although they're miraculous paintings mm -hmm. in so many ways and mm -hmm. far more compositionally complex than I ever thought they were, um, <clears throat> there is an undeniable sense of paint by numbers about them. Mm -hmm. There is a sense of filling in uh, the spaces and the forms defined through a photographic image. Mm -hmm. I don't think that mm -hmm. about this work. I think it transcends the photographic matrix mm -hmm. that it was based on, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it interesting to me. I'm, I'm so glad that you see it that way, because yeah. I, I shouldn't use the term photorealism. I think it's a little bit r yeah. reductive. Um, even in my approach to the source material, there, are, yeah. there will always be bits that I'm more drawn to and that I paint better. Yeah. And it's not because I'm being being lazy or slack. I, yeah. I want the viewer to, to go with me to what I'm interested in. Yeah. I'm not sort of a slave to, to, to that source material. Yeah. And I think um, I'm, I'm glad that you, you, you yeah. feel that way. It's not a long way away from uh, the painting of Gerhard Richter, who we're doing a big exhibition of next yes, year. Did I mention that? Very exciting. Very exciting <laughs> exhibition. But the thing is that for Richter it's always about the photograph as a kind of matrix mm -hmm. from which he works and he yeah. works into the photograph, away from the photograph and creates an image that may be seemingly or apparently photographic but in fact it has an entirely autonomous life yes. um, uh, divorced from or separate from that mm -hmm. photograph. And I think looking back through sort of earlier works of yours I feel that you've moved away from a sort of dependence or codependence on photography. Mm -hmm. And photography's taken on, I think, a more vital life uh, in the way that it feeds up into your painting rather than holds your painting in its thrall, which, you know, for me in some early works of yours, I, I kind of uh, felt some of the suit paintings mm -hmm. for me struck me like that. It was a bit like some of the Richard Prince works, mm -hmm. which look at a photograph used for an advertisement, which is then painted, which is then looked at in a photograph that yes. you've seen in a book, which you then paint. There's yes. this lovely sort of endless loop that goes on between those kind of images. But I feel that this is a great example of a picture which goes through and past that mm -hmm. dependency mm -hmm. on its original, you know, matrix or templates, not the right word, but I think we're kind of saying much the same yes, thing. Yeah. So we've got to, to wind up, but there's a question that I want to ask you at the end about how being acquired through the agency of this appeal makes you feel, because you're son of Queensland, <laughs> you've been a long time visitor to the gallery, supporter of the gallery, friend of the gallery, mm -hmm. and yet this is the first time, apart from one acquisition, uh, purchase that we made of a work of yours a number mm -hmm. of years ago, which actually was the centrepiece of a show that you curated and staged, I think in 2013, mm -hmm. over in Gallery 14. Mm -hmm. So this is a different kind of commitment to your work. And for me, it's um, a very deep commitment following the great success of showing your work in Guy McHugh last year. So how does this make you feel? This is not the same as getting a letter or a phone call saying that a work was acquired. We, yeah. we bought it last week. Yeah. This is. This is a very public it way is. of a work being acquired and hopefully, I'm sure it will, enter the collection. <laughs> How does that work for you? How did you uh, feel it, about that when you were first approached? It's a tremendous honour. I'm, yeah. I'm particularly thrilled. Um, it's exciting for me that, 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 that this is happening, that a major work is, is going into this collection. But, but this particular work, um, I'm, yeah. so, I'm so proud of. It's one of my favourite works. It's, it's definitely one of my my best works, but but you're right, you know, th this is my hometown, this yeah. is the State Gallery that I've grown up with and that I've yeah. had such a long association with and I, I, I think about I think about that little me that used to come here on school <laughs> excursions and and I, I became, I, I started to, to understand this collection and yeah. started to, to <coughs> recognise works and, and would sit and draw them, you know, with other students and then come back here yeah. um, in my spare time, and, and, and this was the place that I first 
imagine my work on, on its walls. And yeah. um, so, so yeah, a, a major work uh, in the collection is a, is a very special yeah. um, uh, acknowledgement from, yeah. from you. And, I, and I'm very grateful. As it should uh, be. And uh, so, so my thanks to you and to, um, to Maud and Simon and the senior yeah. staff for embracing this so warmly. Well, and we're thrilled that you were happy for us to have the work put forward in this way. And um, also thrilled that you were here tonight to help, in a way, make the case <laughs> for the work, which... Um, and and I of think course, my thanks <coughs> to the Foundation as well. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm so delighted that this is... Uh, Thank you. ...starting. <laughs> it's starting. <laughs> Might finish tonight. Um, <laughs> I also want to thank, uh, with Tim, all of those who have already made very generous contributions. We really do appreciate that. But of course, if you're wanting to make a contribution um, to help us acquire this wonderful work, um, you're more than uh, uh, able to see one of the members of the Foundation team tonight. There are four of them here. They'd love to see you. Uh, there are donations that can be made via the brochure that you'll see around the exhibition space when we go upstairs and there's a, a form that can be filled in there. And for those of you, I need to say this, I, I feel this is a great line. For those of you on social media, <laughs> connect <laughs> with us at Quagoma and share your experience tonight using the hashtag Quagoma Appeal. Now, as we've spoken, Michael's already, Michael's already uploaded to his Twitter feed, so uh, I don't need to be speaking to him, but I'm speaking to you. Um, so don't forget the Quagoma Appeal. And now we'd be delighted to invite you upstairs. We're one level up. But those that are at the back of the building, if you'd be so kind as to go straight out the door at the top, those in the bottom half to go back the way you came in. And the painting is on display on level one, adjacent to the members' lounge, where there'll be refreshments. And can I just finally um, close by thanking all of you for coming along tonight and be being so generous and forthcoming in your support of the Foundation and of this appeal, but also, more particularly, would you join me in very warmly thanking Michael Zavros. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.